Montclair students report in from across the world up next on Carpe Diem. Welcome to our show. Over the past year, Montclair State students traveled across the globe, documenting stories on a range of issues. Today, we're going to take a look at the work they produced. For our first story, the Arab Spring is easily the most important global movement so far this century. Though Egypt and Tahrir Square drew the attention of the Western world, the origins of the movement began in Tunisia. Well, a crew of our students traveled to Tunisia last spring to document the development of the revolution, how far the country's come, and how far it still has yet to go. They produced a one-hour web special, and the following clip is an example of the work they put together. Producer Ian Elliott has the story. The Arab Spring began on the streets of Tunisia with the flames of a man on fire. Street vendor Mohamed Bouazizi set himself ablaze in a protest of harassment and confiscation of his wares that he said came from a police officer. Eric Churchill, an American blogger living in Tunisia, says it was about dignity. There was the indignity uh, being poor, but there was also the, the indignity of, of being mistreated, um, the corruption. Wazizi's self-immolation sparked protests in his hometown that grew in number and size until they could no longer be hidden by the state-run media. You had uh, two simultaneous things going on. You had complete denial by the government that anything could be wrong, and you had massive protests. So you would read the newspaper in the morning and everything was fine. And then you would hear on social networks, on Twitter, on Facebook, that there were massive protests. Those protests created a sweeping revolution that led to the ousting of Tunisian dictator Zin al abidin Ben Ali. It was the spark that lit a fire across the Arab world. Egypt, Libya, and Yemen all unseated their dictators soon afterward, and now Syria is close to civil war. So, one year later, we traveled to Tunisia. During our eight-day visit, we met with the many faces of the revolution, from teens to adults and secular to the religious. One thing that seemed to ring the same across all of our interviews, though, was the idea of change. It is the, 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 the generation of Ben Ali that are fantastic. Our youth is, is really, really fantastic. Humanity gets advanced when they get connected by phone and internet. The people who made the revolution actually wanted uh, to kick Ben Ali out and to, they didn't want the power. We did only 10% of what we need to do. We, s we still have 90%. In the end, though, one struck us the most as the face of the new Tunisia. Ali Reba. We reached him through Twitter before we left, and he became our local producer. Like Tunisia, he was young and outspoken, seeking direction, but always looking forward. He played a big role in securing the great interviews that we got, and he also welcomed us into his home, shared a traditional meal, and the story of his best friend's death during the protest. They were shooting people with, uh, with guns, with guns. So one one of the bullets came to his to his chest and uh, he died he didn't die the first thing but even when ambu ambulance came came po poli police stopped it stopped it and said to them do not go there if you go there we can we can even kill the doctor we don't help them we need them to die a new constitution is now being written to protect civil rights an election last fall brought the Anada Party, a moderate Islamic group, to power. We spoke to Amir Arayath, a leader of Anada. I asked him if Tunisia would follow the lead of another moderate Islamic republic in the region. Do you see Turkey as a model for what might happen here in Tunisia? Turkey already has their model, and their model has made positive things. But we have our model, our Tunisian model. Made in Tunisia. During the next hour, we'll have more reports from Tunisia, covering social media's role in the revolution. We had a mailing list for organizing uh, okay. the demonstrations. The role artists and musicians had to play, 
And we got the perspective of Tunisian university students. Uh, the uh, people who started the revolution were poor people looking for butter and bread. Thanks, Ian. Their show on the Arab Spring is available online in full at njvid.net. Next, our students who studied abroad this past summer spent six weeks in Florence, where our production team got the chance to document a festival that was truly Italian. Inside MSU World Report's Amanda Olson has the story. When people think of Italy, they think of wine, art, and beauty. But what better represents the sweetness of the country than gelato? Gelato culture is a fantastic Italian culture made with love, passion and cautiousness of fresh ingredients, fresh products as milk, sugar, eggs, fruit, chocolate. Uh, the first gelato recipe was created in Florence in the 16th century and today Italians are spreading the gelato culture worldwide. This uh, product that reminds you the childhood, the good things, your family, everybody is happy when he eats uh, a gelato. Here at the third annual Florence Gelato Festival, I discovered just how seriously Italians take their ice cream. Being here in the festival is very interesting because uh, I get to work with many, many different chefs and people from everywhere in the world. Um, and we see how, how they work and uh, everyone has a different technique, a different way of doing things. And uh, it's, it's very nice to see how everybody works and uh, you, you can definitely learn from everyone. Here at the festival, gelato maestros from all over the world came to create their own flavors so of gelato. you're going to get four flavors. You're going to get sweet, you're going to get nutty, you're going to get salt, that's, that's and then you're going to get a bouquet through your nose of the maple syrup. Well, we're using California pecans with a salt from the Maldon, UK area. And then we're also bringing in a, 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 a maple syrup from the Vermont and the Quebec regions and that. I'm presenting a Brazilian chocolate, an organic a chocolate from Bahia. And it's a very light chocolate because usually when you eat a chocolate gelato, uh, it's kind of heavy. And this is a very, very light. And I also use passion fruit and uh, cocoa nibs to give it a little bit of crunch. So what's the difference between American ice cream and Italian gelato? The first difference is the amount of fat. Ice cream on average has 28%, gelato has less than 7 Ice cream typically has 60% air, so it looks a lot bigger. Gelato's a lot more condensed, about 15% air. And the third and final difference is the temperature. Ice cream is served at minus 18, and gelato served at minus 11. So a lot less fat, a lot less air, and a lot warmer. It's better for you. Some folks even claim that gelato provides great opportunity in difficult times and can be better for your wallet becomes a very sweet part of even a bad economy. And while the economy goes down, people who spend money on anything want to get good things. They want to get value for money. And Jalato allows you to get value for money because you're spending a little bit of dollars, but you're getting an intense product that's made of high quality. And the benefits of that half an hour of enjoying that Jalato makes the day a lot better. Well, I think the secret ingredient in Jalato is passion and love. For Inside MSU, I'm Amanda Olson. Thanks, Amanda. Next, a special presentation from one of our ongoing projects. In Amman, a unique program attempts to bring music and dance education to the underserved children in Jordan. Students and faculty have a partnership with Swedish NGO Spiritus Mundi to document its struggles and triumphs. We'll be sitting down with Dr. Dave Sanders later in the show to talk about the work in Amman. But first, producer Lindsay Rasman brings us the project in its earliest stages of development. Let's take a look. Swedish NGO Spiritus Mundi creates meeting grounds between people of different social, cultural, and geographic backgrounds. The Hayatuna Aman project brings unique artistic programs to children and underserved communities in Jordan, providing outlets for creativity and self-expression. It's about you know, creating a safe platform for these kids and these beneficiaries to be able to tell their life story. The program also includes women and youth from refugee camps, as well as children from more advantaged areas. 
It's kind of like a kaleidoscope, a desire to look at the kaleidoscope of what Jordan is today. It's about connecting these pieces and uh, having a good time together, cre being creative together. Music changes people's lives, you know, fundamentally so. And if it changes people's lives, it, it also changes society. Pedagogues from Sweden and Jordan work together to bring growth and self-fulfillment to Jordan's vulnerable orphan and refugee children. Singer Sahar Al-Khalifa teaches singing and music. What I am trying to do here with this project with the kids is to let them know how is music it's important and how to use music, how they use music. So that's why I give them a kind of knowledge about music and rhythm because they can express themselves after uh, by using this technique. You can, we can use the song to tell stories, to tell science, to tell numbers, to educate kids with everything. So it's, a, it's kind of a tool for, for them. 200 children from orphanages and socially disadvantaged areas will participate in a series of workshops over a span of two years. A live performance celebrating the results will be featured on national stages. We're trying to convince them that it's, uh, it's not just uh, dancing, it's, it's expressing yourself. And um, they can see like, that the kids are like, even the lyrics when they write the songs, they're amazing, they're re they reflect what they feel and about Jordan and how much they belong and, uh, and uh, their rights. كيف قلت أنظم قوافي في أغنية وأحب مع مكسيم الرقص وال... وكيف راح أني أثبت حالي في رقص أو براب أمشي حالي وأنه كنت أحب مع صحر إقاعات Rapper Ostaz Sam grew up in a Palestinian refugee camp and went on to be a finalist on Arabs Got Talent. Sam and Swedish musician David Rothland teach songwriting. Rap is talk about like the experience in life. You know, life even is, is happy or not happy, we're happy because we listen to real songs, you know, to real lives. And this is hip hop, this is me, this is Hayatun. Music is just a, a you know, a gateway to, to ex expressing itself and being creative. That's why I'm trying to use this to make them understand they have a mind of their own that they can use. This is about putting words to your emotions of what you feel when you hear the beat, okay? So this is what music is about in songwriting. Satisfaction you get when you do something that you really love doing, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's worth everything. So if I just could give them a small taste of that feeling, I know what, they, what it could do for them. الحركة عن مثلاً أشياء من محطنا نغمة إحنا مغامد عن نغمة ميوزك يعني طنا يا إنه بس بدون أغاني وهيك آه بدون هيك مغامد عيني وإنه بحس بأشياء المكان بتذكرني فيها مشاعري اللون مثلاً اللي بحبه الحركات أشياء زي هيك ماكسيم أياد is from the Ukraine he teaches hip hop and dance The most interesting thing for me that you know you're doing something for the whole region here, you know, like there is not just you just a teacher. Make some step, make yourself work. You have a chance now to learn something new in your life, use this chance. We have to work and maximum change the child's like you know wishes mind uh, his passion about life you know with the help of art to make him loving art for upcoming his future i change i help i support someone i make someone happy then i will be feeling myself successful and happy
this is what the kids they this is what they need. They need to be to feel involved and to feel part of this community and to feel that they are heard. Hayatuna's unique and groundbreaking approach helps disadvantaged youth in Jordan find their voice and improve their lives. Hayatuna in Arabic means uh, our life. It's a result of the dream. Joining us now in the studio to talk about the Hayatuna Project and our other continuing projects in the Middle East are Dr. David Sanders from our School of Communication and Media here at Montclair and Ian Elliott, our student producer on the Arab Spring. Guys, thanks for being here. Thank you for uh, having us. So, Dave, we have a number of uh, open partnerships um, in, the, in the Middle East right now for our students. Uh, tell us about specifically the partnership with Spiritus Mundi and how that originally developed. Well, it originally developed about two years ago. Uh, I had met the, the uh, executive director of Spiritus Mundi in China, actually at a conference that I went to that was uh, sponsored by the Global Education uh, Center here. And uh, we kind of hit it off and we began talking about how the university and his organization might work together. And we actually brought him to the United States uh, around this time last year, actually, for the Global Education Center's program on justice and civil society in the Muslim world. And he did a, a lecture for us. Um, actually, it was a panel discussion with some of our students as well on uh, the work that they were doing there. And it was actually at the, at the dinner following the panel that uh, we, we had with uh, Peter Yarrow and a number of other guests that we had for that uh, event that the whole idea of doing this joint project came up and uh, we really put it together very quickly and uh, it was a very uh, serendipitous thing because we had just hired Steve McCarthy uh, as a, a new staff producer here uh, and uh, the whole thing came together uh, very quickly and we were able to take uh, two students as well as Steve and myself to Jordan last uh, July to get the whole program started. And what, what's so important about developing these partnerships? These partnerships, I, I think they're really very innovative. Uh, global education and study abroad is nothing new to the broadcasting department. We've been doing it for about 15 or 16 years. Every summer we go to Europe to do uh, a month of study abroad with students. In a much more traditional study abroad uh, approach, there's classes, students are, are studying the language of the local uh, country that, uh, that we're visiting. These trips that we started doing last year, beginning with Tunisia and then uh, Amman this, uh, this spring and, and again recently uh, during winter break, are really a very different experience for students because uh, summer study abroad, students are there to take classes and we do production work, but we're, t we're touring around and they're sightseeing and it's, sure. it's, it's a very different experience than these, these um, reporting trips that Ian was actually one of the first groups to go where it's totally intense. For t 10 days, we are doing round the clock pretty much production. And I think Ian can attest to the fact that the scheduling on this was really intense. And Ian, you've done, you've done uh, study abroad programs, but you've also done, done one of those special assignment projects. I've been abroad with the program uh, three times. First time we went to Bermuda to film Ryan's Heart with Lindsay Rasman and Ryan Miller uh, and Steve McCarthy. The second time was Tunisia. And those trips were about two weeks apart. And uh, that was the first time I ever left the country, was Bermuda. Then we went to Tunisia for eight days and uh, countless hours of producing. And then the uh, final trip with the department was with uh, Dave Sanders for the study abroad in Italy. So why, what, is, what, do, what are these kind of opportunities, the, these, uh, these unique production experiences do for our television production students? Uh, it, it's a way to really apply from uh, what I think is that it's a way to apply all the work that you've had through TV one, two, and three. You can take all the field production notes where you, you, you want to make sure that you've got everything in line before you get on the plane. You want to make sure that everything is going to go through customs just fine. When, you, when wheels go down in the foreign country, you know where you're headed. You know, you have a sense of where a hotel is, what the city's like, what's going on in the city. In Tunisia, that was really important because that was an area that was quite, uh, that was riding quite frequently uh, up until our uh, arrival there. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be landing in the middle of um, a bad time to be there, you know, because we are Americans and uh, 
were not always welcome abroad, so we wanted to make sure that it was safe for us to produce there. Um, in Italy, there, there, was a, there was a distinct difference between all three of those trips. Bermuda was a really emotional weekend. It was four days, um, and it was really about watching a family that had been torn apart by the death of a loved one not be reunited, but made anew with a new member, with Ryan. Um, and Tunisia... Who we should say received a heart transplant yes. here in, in New Jersey from this, this, uh, this boy in Bermuda. Right, and Ryan's heart is available in full online. I believe that's also on NGVid, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and then Tunisia was eight days, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours a day of solid. You wake up, you grab your gear, you go, and you're not done until the night. And then it, even when you come back to the hotel, you're not done because you got to make sure everything's charged up for the next day. You got to dump all the footage, make sure it's more in more than one location. Um, and then Italy was a really nice experience. That was one of my most favorite trips because it wasn't just eight days of running and gunning. It was six weeks. You, you got to um, get a feel for the culture. You got a feel for the people, uh, a lot more of a feel than we did for uh, either Bermuda or Tunisia. Um, but there was still a bit of a deadline on the Italian trip because uh, we had pitched this gelato project before we had even put wheels down. But uh, we came in and we saw this international gelato festival was happening the first weekend we were there. And we weren't fully ready to go, but we made it happen. We made it work. And I think it came out as a great project. And there's, and as, as having done foreign assignment myself, um, there's something that's so particular about that those those quick excursions, those four days, those ten days, those round the clock around the clock production. When you bring that back, it's like coming back from boot camp. Mm -hmm. So and so. a huge amount of work after you get back. Mm. I mean, yeah, I know. I you were just in in uh, in um, Jordan with us, where we were. Things would just keep coming up. We'd think we were done for the day, and there'd be this last minute thing that we. Go, mm -hmm. feel we had to go out and shoot. Same thing happened with Ian in Tunisia. I mean, we kept on looking for that day off that we'd have within, uh, you know, within those 10 days, and every single day, another really good interview would come up, and we'd say, okay, we're bagging the uh, sightseeing, and we're, we, we have to do this interview. And as a testament to these guys, I mean, we ran them ragged, but the last day we were there, we, watched the, we were watching the news in a restaurant, and about five people that showed up on their national news were people that we had interviewed that week that we were there. So, uh, so what's, uh, what are some of the things that are uh, coming up for uh, students abroad? Well, we're, go we're doing another trip to, uh, to a summer study, a traditional summer study abroad to Florence this, uh, this spring in uh, late May to late June um, with this new School of Communication and Media uh, being formed this past year as well. We're looking to do a lot more of these uh, international reporting trips. We have nothing on the books as of yet, but uh, um, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure they will come up. Actually, we'll probably be going back to Jordan to finish documenting the Hayatuna program. I mean, the piece that we saw was a very early part of our participation. It reads more as a promotional piece for Hayatuna, but uh, the trip that you just came back from there is much more of a documentary style um, piece about the development of the children involved in this, and I think we'll probably be going back there as well as to Egypt where they're starting a, um, a program as well. And just to put the minds of parents who might have students at Montclair State at ease, we are very, very careful about how we handle these trips. And the Tunisia excursion that we went on was actually originally supposed to be to Egypt. We had an Egyptian student that was going home to visit their family for the first time since the revolution. And things were a little too dicey there to feel safe, so we very much at the last minute switched our destination to Tunisia where I had actually just been uh, a few months before. And uh, we always follow State Department guidelines and are very careful about taking students into situations that uh, their parents wouldn't want them in. Well, but there are those unique challenges of, you know, we are, we're, we're operating in the, under the, under the sort of rubric of the, of students at a public school. I mean, there are, there's so many challenges that you face in terms of uh, safety precautions, uh, learning the area, uh, a lot of um, bureaucracy, I'm sure, but there's... Well, there's, there, there are a lot of challenges, I'd agree, but those challenges are only going to make you better on the back end. You know, learning to overcome those different and unique situations 
in the end, it's an experience you've had, and you can mark down, yeah, I've done this before. So when I graduate, if someone wants to send me to the Middle East, if they want to send me out somewhere to report, I can say, you know, I have that under my belt. That's a skill that I've developed. I can't say that I'm a professional, but I'm willing to learn more. And I think as a student, it really adds to my potential value to an employer. So that's why I really appreciate the opportunity to go abroad with the program. And I think that, you know, as students, it's something that really develops us in a professional manner. Is there a way that the students develop outside of their, their professional skills and as, as, as production assets? Is there something that about the foreign experiences, the foreign culture that, that you bring back with you as an individual? Can I break in here? Oh, absolutely, please. <laughs> just as an example, I mean, this, it's wonderful experience professionally, as Ian was just saying. But so many of our students at the university, some of them have not left the tri-state area, you know, in, the, in their entire lives. And uh, to bring students who really have no experience outside, really, the state of New Jersey to a place like Jordan or a place like Tunisia, uh, it opens up their eyes to a totally different world. And all, you know, we tend to be a little, uh, have a little phobia about the Middle East or the Muslim world here. And for our students to have gone, and I mean, you were one of them. Uh, I think you were a little bit more internationally oriented than some of our other students. But that experience, it's like it opened up an entirely new world to them. And it doesn't, it, it takes away from them seeing the rest of the world as the other. And the common humanity, I think, that you experience with the kids and the pedagogues who were from Sweden, from, uh, from the Ukraine, uh, Palestinian refugees, I, I mean, they're people now. They're not just uh, the, these other people that live uh, halfway around the world. Absolutely. They're real. Well, thanks, guys, so much for being with us today. Ian, Dave, thanks. And that's all the time we have for today. Special thanks to our foreign correspondents and everyone who made today's show possible. For more information on this or any other edition of Carpe Diem, contact us at carpediem at mail.montclair.edu or call 973-655-5158. Until next time, I'm Jack Smith IV and this is Carpe Diem.